So I think it's time for me to take over. First of all, thank you very much, Amita, for the closing remarks and for the excellent summary. And uh, remember what she said, make use of the chat box because we're gonna save all your comments. So if you have anything else to let us know, uh, even maybe your comment, find somehow the way into the song, please do so. Secondly, a big, big thank you to Sandy Wynn for moderating the session. And of course, to all her speakers in the session, thank you very much for joining. This is not the end of this call. It's the end of the first session. We are going to have now a break, um, unfortunately only for five minutes. So um, normally the up and annual meeting goes over two days. Today we have only four hours. So maybe the a generous five minute break is uh, not that great, but uh, I hope you can get up, stretch, get a coffee and be back in five minutes. And then I will hand over to another colleague and we will discuss the critical role of community-based approaches to eliminate malaria and address other primary health issues and strengths in health systems. And so don't go away, stay online, mute yourself, switch off your camera, but come back in five minutes from now. And I think we're gonna play two videos for also indicating the time and see you in five minutes from now. Thanks to all of you for tuning in for the first session of the Malaria Week. Yes, and I hope you have a, co a coffee or tea. There's one colleague saying there is no tea or coffee. Then hopefully tomorrow you're better prepared. Uh, thank you very much, Sandy Wynn again. And if you have to leave now, have a good day, but we sincerely hope that you can join us also for the second session and leave some comments or some love. Thank you. Yes.
So thank you very much for sharing these two wonderful videos. I think we're going to try to share the links later in the chat box. Probably you will be also able to find these video links at the website of appelma.org. So I think uh, given the time, we're going to start right away. And it's time for our second session of the Upman Annual Meeting 2020. And as you have heard before, it's a session on the critical role of community-based approaches for malaria elimination. And I welcome all our participants who have been online already for nearly two hours. And of course, also I welcome everybody who just joins for this second session at our Upman Annual Meeting 2020. So for the newcomers, just a reminder, please make use of our chat box and share your thoughts and comments there. And we're gonna videotape the session and please keep your mics on mute and your videos off if you're not a speaker. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the moderator and chair for the next session. Her name is Jocelyn Neukom, and she's a consultant working with Upman and Appelma, and she brings 25 years of experience in designing, implementing, and evaluating community health programs to the table, and of course, very much with a focus on malaria, but also other health priorities. And her technical expertise includes social and behavioral change, communication, social marketing, social franchising, and public-private partnerships. And Jocelyn, as far as I know, she worked in 11 countries in the Asia Pacific, and she's currently based in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. So over to you, Jocelyn, the session is all yours. Thank you, Jost, and good afternoon, all of you. It's wonderful to be with you today for this very exciting and packed session from rainy Phnom Penh. Um, we are very fortunate today to be able to organize this event with um, co-sponsorship in partnership with Comic Relief, GSK, as well as the Regional Platform for Civil Society Organizations, um, the platform in the GMS. So we are very fortunate to have the sponsorship and as well as participation from a number of expert speakers representing our national malaria control programs, as well as civil society partners who are working in this space. And I am so looking forward to learning from all of our speakers, as well as our participants, about how to put communities at the center of elimination. We have a number of uh, pieces of evidence and case studies to share with all of you to learn more about um, how Dr. Zung and Sartek explained at the beginning of today's meeting, we can all work together to um, implement multi-sectoral approaches, bottom up, uh, community centered, and um, of course involving strong uh, contributions from both the civil society and private sector um, channels, as well as, as our national health systems. I would like to briefly explain the plan for this session. We have two sections and we will pause for discussion for some Q&A after each of the two sections. We would like you to please actively participate, use the chat function throughout the session. We really want to hear from you, your questions, your ideas. And as Amita has explained, we'll, we, we will be channeling today's discussion, both the key points from our speakers as well as your input into a set of key messages that will be shared with senior officials and other um, participants in, in the remainder of the Malaria Week meetings. So um, with, with no further ado, I would like to invite um, Ben uh, from Comic Relief GSK to, to officially open and, and give some uh, initial remarks for us. Ben, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, greetings from a, a fairly cold morning here in London. Um, I just wanted to kick off, obviously, by kind of thanking you all for providing us with this uh, speaking slot. <clears throat> it's my first uh, malaria week uh, this year, so it's um, a real pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> and I'd just like to thank Appleman, Atmen, 
the GMS regional malaria CSO platform uh, and of course to, to Jocelyn uh, for her kind of expert guidance in, in support of, of moderating and, and helping to, to organise this uh, event. Um, I will be brief uh, as I know that we've got a, a huge amount to get through in, in this couple of hours but I just wanted to provide you before we got into the, the panel of expert speakers, just a little bit of background uh, about Comic Relief and our, and our, our partnership with, uh, with GSK, the Fighting Malaria Improving Health Partnership. <clears throat> so Comic Relief, we're a, a UK-based organisation. Uh, some of you may have worked with us in the past, but I suspect uh, in this part of the world, many of you haven't. Um, so I thought it'd be useful to just give you a, a tiny bit of information. We, we describe ourselves as an agency for social change. We're a UK registered charity. We fundraise from the UK public, uh, working with uh, celebrities and, and, and media uh, talent and others. Uh, and then we make grants here in the UK and around the world. Um, we have a really long standing commitment to, to tackling malaria and it's been a, a big focus of our work since, since we were launched back in the, uh, in the 1970s uh, during our flagship fundraising campaign every year in partnership with the BBC called Red Nose Day. Uh, we've consistently highlighted the impact that malaria has on, on poorer communities in particular um, children and, and, and women. Uh, so in 2015, we, we joined forces with GSK to launch the Fights in Malaria Improving Health Partnership, uh, through which we provide £22 million in grant funding over five years uh, across seven countries, um, three of which are in the, the greater Mekong sub-region, hence why I'm here with, with you all today. Um, so our partnership has approached the malaria challenge as a key entry point from which wider health issues can also be improved. So this is a, a really kind of central part of the theory of change of our partnership. We believe that investing in the fight against malaria is a springboard for reinforcing the wider health system. And to deliver this in practice, all of our grants um, have focused on one or in many cases, several of the following areas. So number one is increasing the supply of good quality healthcare. Number two, increasing demand for and access to primary healthcare. Number three, and I think really quite important for, to, for today's discussion and, and our work in the GMS is strengthening surveillance systems and data management, um, both at the community, uh, the district and, and at the national level as well. Uh, and then fourthly, improved awareness of malaria challenges among decision makers. Uh, so that's why it's fantastic today to have so many representatives of, of governments from across the region here kind of hearing uh, case studies and stories of best practice and, and ideas and, and, and practical uh, solutions for them to take forward in their work. So um, our initial scroping across the region led us to investments in Laos, Cambodia and Myanmar. Uh, and it's really wonderful, as I say, to be joined by some of those NGO partners and, and governments today. Um, at the time, the re and still is, the region was in elimination phase. It was therefore critical for us to focus on improved case detection and community level diagnosis. Uh, the work we funded uh, focused heavily on surveillance systems, data collection and community engagement, um, including comprehensive behaviour change communication. So I won't delve too deep into the programme as, as we'll be hearing from several of the partners we worked with in the region who can no doubt speak to it far more eloquently and in more detail than, than I possibly could. Um, but what I would like to finish on and stress is the critical role of community engagement in all of our investments there. Um, as well as ensuring that our funded work uh, was aligned with national priorities set by national malaria control programs and, and other instruments of, of government as well. So it's in this spirit that we wanted to collaborate with you all today to create space for an open discussion on best practice and to look forward at what can be done together to advance health outcomes and tackle malaria uh, across the region. Um, thanks again for having us on. I look forward to hearing from this excellent uh, list of, of panellists and, and big thanks to our co-hosts uh, again and to Jocelyn for, uh, for convening. Over. Thank you so much, Ben. We're grateful for the support from Comic Relief and GSK, which has made this event possible. And now uh, we would like to introduce our first section, which will review a number of pieces of evidence and case studies from 
few different country contexts. We have a lot to learn from our next three speakers, and it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tin, who is a technical specialist with Malaria Consortium. Dr. Tin has spent years uh, at community level uh, supporting community engagement, and we are very fortunate to have him with us. I would like to invite Dr. Tin to share his slides and kick off the session. Thank you. Thanks, Joss. Um, thanks, Ben. Thanks, everybody, for having Malaria Consortium at this session. Um, thanks for the kind introductions. Um, if we could uh, pull up the slide, please. Um, today, we'll be sharing the work that the Malaria Consortium has done in Myanmar, uh, primarily about the community-based uh, approaches and delivering integrated health services for under five children, um, uh, uh, how that contributed towards the malaria elimination in Myanmar. So most of the, the information we have shared in this sessions will be based on our, our mid and end line program evaluations uh, of our own program and including pulling up uh, relevant uh, evidence to support our messages here. Next slide, please. So in the context of Myanmar, where we are seeing um, a very um, a varying epidemiology of malaria in, inside the, in, in the country, um, and primarily the, the, the evidence that we are seeing in, in, in Asia Pacific, especially in Greater Mekong sub-region of dramatic reduction of malaria over the, over the uh, past few decades has been um, the, attributable by the work of the largely uh, costed network of the community health community-based malaria volunteers. But in the beginning, we these volunteers are trained as malaria-only volunteers. And, and there's a reason for it, for it because they, we need to rapidly expand the malaria quality, malaria case management services. And, and, and uh, training uh, people on malaria uh, case management is, is, is rather uh, feasible to do at the village villagers level. So these interventions could help us uh, redu reduce malaria uh, quite significantly. Now is the time to relook at the, the how do we keep the, the, this success maintained and build up, continue build up progress upon it. And one of the evidence that we are starting to see is, you know, um, when malaria volunteers are coupled with uh, additional healthcare services um, that really uh, helps these uh, uh, testings to be up, uh, up testing uptake to be really high at the community and then overall led to overall continued reduction of malaria over years as you've seen in this uh, study. And in our work, the most of the uh, main questions that come up before our implementation of a project is, will your volunteers able to do complex diagnosis, triage of, uh, you know, differentiating uh, danger signs, facilitate referrals, using commodities to treat simple cases outside of malaria. And we, in fact, we have found that they are quite capable of doing that. One evidence we're seeing here is um, malaria volunteers are able to diagnose uh, common cases of cold uh, pneumonia pneumonia and five children are able to uh, provide rational treatment according within the alignment of the national guidelines. Next slide, please. So in, in another important aspect we look, we need to look at at the malaria elimination progress, the countries progressing to malaria elimination is because of the uh, low reduction of the malaria cases in the community, meaning uh, community volunteers are seeing much less cases than they did in the past in the control phase. And that is poses a particular challenge for community malaria volunteers to really maintain the testing and overall contribute to the highly reliable surveillance system to demonstrate that there is no transmission ongoing. So in, in our national strategic plan, in Myanmar national strategic plan, in all receptive area, we target that uh, at least 10% of the vulnerable people who are suspected of malaria has to be tested tested by other microscopy or uh, uh, RGT. So to be able to do that, we need to attract people um, uh, to keep, keep testing whenever they're suspected of malaria. And this is a particularly challenging, especially because of the, uh, the, the risk perception change and the acceptance from both provider side as well as community sites also started to change. Because one more and more you test people, you, you, you keep seeing negative patients and that really makes them think that whether their service is still re relevant. And then you have a whole range of other health problems that communities have seen as a priority. Unless you're able to tackle them comprehensively, uh, uh, not alone managing in full, but also, but if you could at least uh, um, 
manage and facilitate referral and help connect them with the public health systems, you're starting to see a difference. And the, 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 at the same time, you'll be able to attract them to keep uh, uh, tested, um, to keep uh, receiving malaria tests uh, at your service. So uh, this is a, one of the uh, approaches, uh, evidence that we have found that we need to uh, attach and expand the services of the malaria volunteers. Next slide, please. So another important factor is, as I mentioned before, as malaria cases go down, especially in elimination setting, people are starting to see more negative cases. A patient comes up to your to to you at malaria volunteers, and you 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 test it negative, and then you say, oh, there's nothing I can do more for you. You, if you have any other problem like fever, you need to go to the health system, and we all know that that's not going to happen, especially for people in the living in a remote setting who, who don't have the fortune to access to, to the towns or things like that. So one of the things that we need to look at is that what motivates the malaria volunteers to keep in their service, because that is really important until we, we reach the elimination. We need to maintain the service outlets. We need to maintain the service availability in all the communities. And one of the things that we have found out is it's, it's once their roles has been expanded to able to be able to touch on the other health issues, uh, it's one of the key motivator for, for them to maintain in service. And we need to capitalize on that as we uh, transition into, uh, into elimination. Malaria only serve volunteers are not no no not not, not you know um, not going to stay for a while unless we have transformed their roles to be able to 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 tackle more community health problems, including malaria. Um, next slide, please. Another thing that we have to look at at elim progressing elimination is we need to uh, relook at how do we engage communities and. When, when I say community engagement, we need to mean business. Uh, we, don't, we, we can't just do community engagement for the sake of doing it. And, and largely, malaria programs has been very vertical, uh, top-down approach where the healthcare workers are solution. They, we have the solution and we give the solution to the communities without real, fully realizing the community expertise in developing that solution that they need. So in one of the different approach that we use in this project is called community dialogue approach, which is an inclusive dialogue uh, platform that invite all members of the communities, uh, all women and children to, to come together and to share their experience of the recent malaria or other, any other uh, health diseases that they are interested in, and, and we can share good practices. And one of the things that uh, uh, specific uh, to malaria is to, the, to this platform, one, Finding that I find very interesting is how these dialogues help people to, you know, sue uh, the bad, repair bad nets because it's, it's, you know, when there is a tear, the LLI lines will not be effective at all. So um, platform like this, which really engage them to how to adopt this behavior. And there's one thing that we have to address, which is that uh, uh, we, we, we shouldn't be uh, sufficient, uh, uh, complacent ourselves just to giving information to the public because we need to take a look at this knowledge and attitude disconnect and how do we uh, adopt the uh, behavior adoption encourage the behavior adoption. I think one of these approaches are really helpful for that. Next slide, please. So um, in, 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 I, I would like to leave this session with a message of, you know, in, in times of COVID, in times of uncertainty around, we need resilience now more than ever. And one of the things that really captured our, us is how this project helped connect all the communities to the uh, public health systems. Uh, once the malaria volunteers, as you've seen in this, uh, in this case, as you acquire more new skills and knowledges, you're able to expand her service, make her relevant in the community, make her work more impactful, making her more motivated to do more work on that. So that is a really a positive energy we need to build on and to, to yield more public health impact. So as to his, his, her supervisors and uh, feeling more encouraged to, to educate volunteers more to support them to do the work better and then help to connect to the public health system, the council of officers, where these malaria volunteer act as a gatekeepers, making that health service more accessible as well as less burden to be put at the, uh, the, the health systems. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm available for any questions or comment. Thank you so much, Tin. What a wonderful overview. There's a lot to digest there. I think among other things, you have certainly highlighted for us one of several data points, which really emphasizes the fact that community-based health workers can make a difference in terms of malaria service provision and other 
public health services. So the power of, of integration is certainly coming through. And I also very much appreciate um, Malaria Consortium's work with respect to community dialogue approach, uh, which, which nicely emphasizes um, what many of us on this call um, know well, which is that community engagement is so much more than simply collecting information from communities or delivering information, products or services to communities. It's a much more proactive and iterative um, process. So thank you for, for sharing that. And we will certainly come back to you um, with a question or two. But before we do that, uh, let me introduce our second speaker, Dr. Quetet, who is the Deputy Director with PSI Myanmar, is with us to share um, some of the evidence collected in Myanmar by PSI. Uh, I think all of us will learn uh, a few things from, from Dr. Quetet, including potentially at least one new acronym. Dr. Quetet, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Edward, Edmund, uh, GSK, and also Comrade Rolly for uh, inviting me to share uh, this, like uh, our experience on community uh, based approach. It was a, a true honor to be here. And thank you so much, Josh, for your excellent guidance uh, how to prepare presentations and you know, fantastic moderation. So without further ado, uh, let me proceed to the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, yes. So uh, today I'm going to share a bit about like uh, BSI uh, community engagement in the context of uh, malaria elimination. So uh, next slide, please. So as Dr. Tien has mentioned previously uh, yeah, in, the, in this session, so that community-based malaria provide us a place, uh, you know, a crucial role in the uh, malaria uh, control and malaria elimination in the uh, in Myanmar. So as many of you uh, know about Myanmar, it's very uh, diverse and complex uh, uh, country. So uh, we have uh, extremely hard to reach areas and we have like a lot of ethnic uh, conflict sensitive areas, non-government control areas, amid uh, low public health spending and also with high uh, out-of-pocket uh, expenditure. So uh, in the community said that there are a lot of players are providing uh, malaria services, uh, namely like uh, uh, GPs and retailers, pharmacies, uh, EHO uh, service providers, CSO providers, and also uh, village volunteers and even traditional uh, healers. So uh, those community providers are contributing uh, significantly uh, significant malaria uh, testing and uh, treatment services in the community. In the uh, previous session, I noticed that uh, uh, our like uh, national program manager has mentioned that over 50% of uh, people who fall aid in less 30 days see services from the private setup. And also 65% of malaria uh, you know, uh, service delivery is from the private setup. It is a very important context uh, situation that before uh, we proceed. Next slide, please. So PSI it has been uh, working in Myanmar for over 25 years. And our malaria program has initiated since 2003 with the general practitioners. So that gradually uh, we have included that uh, community volunteers and also outside providers and private outlets uh, into their uh, various uh, network providing malaria uh, services. Uh, so far, uh, we have over 3,500 uh, community-based providers uh, providing uh, malaria services. In 2019, those providers uh, tested over 500,000 uh, fever cases for malaria with RDDs and also have identified over 4,300 uh, malaria positive cases in 2019 alone. Next slide, please. So that uh, for those uh, various kinds of providers, so the PSI has uh, provided like a, 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 you know, high quality training based on the national guidelines and also a provision of malaria RTTs and um, anti-malaria uh, drugs and also other associated like uh, uh, fever case management uh, tools and things like that. And also uh, we provide our regular uh, data collection and also a quality assurance mechanism like uh, uh, for both data quality assurance and clinical quality assurance. We also provide uh, health behavior change communication materials uh, to be used like uh, IEC distribution and through the education session. And moving this forward, uh, we also acknowledge that uh, with the new uh, national health plan, uh, there is a, uh, you know, a more demand for the IR integration of health services. And particularly 
uh, we are providing integrated health services to like a, a private GPs and also a, a community a malaria volunteers using uh, ICM approach. So uh, and then one thing uh, to notice that uh, in very recently there were a lot of discussion about like a community based health worker policy. I believe that that will uh, come out soon. That new policy call for greater integration of the health services at the community level. Uh, to be in line with the national health policy and provision of visit essential package of health services. So the uh, PSI has been working closely with the uh, national health plan implementation monitoring unit, NIMU, uh, about the how this uh, community-based health worker can be integrated into uh, like a national health system using a strategy purchasing or uh, you know, social contracting mechanism. So those are things are moving this uh, forward. Or the rule of the, uh, the you know expanding rule of community health workers even beyond the malaria. Next slide, please. So this is uh, for the community engagement. So that there is a PSI uh, unique uh, methodology calling EIP. So EIP uh, stands for uh, empathy, insights, and prototyping. So this is a multidisciplinary approach that we adopted from a commercial marketing technique and also uh, uh, well-tested uh, human standard design. So, so empathy, uh, that would allow us to understand what behaviors our communities are practicing and also the why question of those behavior, why they are doing, you know, behaving uh, this way. So that empathy allows us, uh, you know, to put our consumer, our target audience at the center of our decision making. So we use like a, you know, a day in the life exercise. You know, we use the client's journey, whether you know, their current health seeking pattern. Uh, we use who are they, their trusted providers. And you know, we use other empathy tools that we put ourselves in the shoes of our communities that in the, you know, the way they see, the way they listen and the way they feel. And then we consider their input in the, our program design. So they also using this like a empathy uh, you know, uh, finding so that we develop insights. So the insights, uh, would sharpen the, our you know, observation from the program and routine data collection inside, uh, you know, strengthen our understanding of the audience and then inside strengthen our like a, a, a deeper understanding of the uh, uh, program activities. And also uh, prototyping. Prototyping is the thing that uh, we all create together with the community. So because community, they know a lot of this uh, locate context. So that when we create like a, a uh, prototype together with the community. Those solutions are not only feasible, but also desirable by the communities. So those are the uh, like a, a beauty that you know the use of ERB tools. How community can be actively engaged in the uh, community uh, as, uh, engagement activities. Next slide, please. So here I'd like to share uh, a bit about like uh, one of the uh, projects uh, we were supported by the Kwame Relief and GSK uh, in 2017 and 2019. So we uh, operated this project at uh, 16 townships in three regions at north uh, western part of the region, bordering with the uh, China and India. So we contacted our two inside learnings uh, in 2018 and 2019 to identify our provider behaviors uh, to provide malaria services and understanding of their beneficiary health seeking behaviors. So uh, we have learned that uh, that there is that uh, uh, you know insufficient knowledge on the uh, to do RDD testing uh, for the uh, every fever cases and also lack of interest and awareness on the health education session. And also the, a lot of uh, our audience, they typically first, you know, self-medicate uh, before they do like, a, you know, they seek the proper uh, treat, you know, care. And also uh, the communities, they do not know uh, much about like a malaria prevention methods and often confused like a dengue and malaria and other diseases. So that based on those insights that we updated uh, IEC and education messages uh, to be aligned with the, you know, the knowledge gaps and also uh, we committed to do more community engagement so that we have done two more uh, community engagement activities uh, late last year and this year. And also uh, we contacted uh, uh, refresher training and updating providers on the uh, uh, malaria knowledge. So uh, to conclude, uh, community engagement is the integral part of the uh, malaria uh, programming. So it is the growing evidence that, you know, there's, uh, you know, the malaria elimination, especially for the like a, a you know a virus elimination, 
So without the community engagement, community-based approach, it will be uh, very difficult and then we need to engage with community more and more, more than ever. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cotet, for introducing us to a new acronym, EIP, and, um, and equally, if not more important, for sharing with us PSI's experience using both private um, as well as, as public community level providers to uh, achieve scale with integrated malaria and other health services in Myanmar. I think um, there's lots for us to discuss there and we will certainly come back to you with, with questions shortly. But first I would like to turn to our third speaker for the first section, Dr. Leonard Boaz, who is the deputy director for the Vector-Borne Disease Control Program in the Solomon Islands. Dr. Boaz brings 20 years of experience, technical and managerial, and we are very fortunate to have him together with our other speakers um, contributing to today's event. Dr. Boaz, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening and good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Upman to, uh, for inviting uh, the Malaria Program from the Solomon Islands to participate in this uh, uh, session. Uh, I think uh, from my opinion, uh, when we talk about community engagement, I think that's the last frontier for Solomon Islands because uh, as we work through the communities, we are still facing challenges and uh, a lot of difficulties in uh, uh, how to uh, invite uh, uh, communities to participate in the uh, malaria control and elimination. So um, I will be very uh, brief on my presentation. So, uh, can I have my first slide, please? <clears throat> the second slide, please. Yeah. Uh, in the Solomon Islands, there's uh, a few approaches uh, that we deployed, uh, that are de deployed by the program uh, for uh, communities to participate uh, in malaria control and elimination. Uh, when we talk about uh, the malaria program, I think we have a lot of support from uh, the government uh, in, at uh, some uh, stages. Uh, but as I speak, I think uh, most of our operations are funded by Global Fund. And I thank Global Fund for keep on supporting us uh, in our effort to uh, control and eliminate malaria in Solomon Islands. The few community-based approaches that we deployed that I can pick out. Uh, first of all, in 2018, we actually met with the uh, government of Solomon Islands, with the Prime Minister of Solomon Islands to develop this uh, malaria elimination roadmap, which uh, included uh, on how communities are going to participate in uh, our effort to eliminate malaria. Now, uh, as I speak, I think we we need more discussion on this uh, malaria elimination roadmap. And just recently, we uh, developed our malaria uh, national strategic plan uh, for 2021 to 25. And I think uh, we have included some uh, part of the malaria roadmap in that uh, uh, national strategic plan. Uh, secondly, I think uh, we have so many, uh, more than 100 officers that are being posted throughout the country uh, in all provinces. And these officers are responsible for the control and element, uh, the co control, and they are trying their best to eliminate malaria in Solomon Islands by 2030. Now, uh, however, as uh, uh, these uh, malaria officers are responsible for all the malaria operations within the country, but unfortunately, they uh, we would like them to uh, uh, 
uh, be stationed at the zone level, at the community levels, yeah? But we are lacking uh, uh, the logistics and infrastructure for our officers to be deployed all over the uh, communities, especially in our health zones. Because in uh, the provinces, uh, we have uh, health boundaries, uh, and uh, we call them uh, regional boundaries and zone boundaries, which we would like our officers to uh, uh, base and work closely with the communities in terms of malaria control, uh, carrying out malaria activities and uh, so forth. So in our 2021 to 25 uh, National Malaria Strategic Plan, we are requesting to build uh, infrastructures for our officers to be around the provinces so that they can do their best out of uh, what we are trying to do in Solomon Islands. The other activities that we uh, rely on is village health settings. Now, uh, only around we have uh, been seeing, uh, our data have uh, shown that there are pockets of uh, villages that could not be controlled uh, at some, uh, the number of cases are still too high in those uh, uh, communities. And these communities are selected throughout the uh, uh, provinces, uh, not only in one province, but around the, uh, all the provinces. And these uh, village health settings is led by the uh, Health Promotion Division of the Ministry of Health. And they go down to the communities and they select uh, malaria village health, uh, health promoter. That's what they used to call it. And we have developed the guidelines on uh, their responsibilities on what they should do. And, that, uh, and we actually have developed a uh, uh, a pamphlet, uh, it's a, like a kind of manual that they are going to use to uh, educate people in those uh, healthy village uh, uh, settings. So it includes uh, talk about malaria, not only malaria, but NCDs, sanitations, and uh, uh, other diseases. So we have developed a big uh, manual for them to uh, do the job, uh, carry out the activity of village healthy settings in uh, the communities. So in while in the communities, they have to uh, engage the communities, uh, do profiling and uh, give, uh, give the community to develop the action plan on how to uh, support them. Yeah, so they have, uh, the communities have to uh, come up with some uh, kind of a budget, uh, or support, and then we provide the tools and resources for them to carry out uh, the uh, activities of the village healthy settings. So that's, uh, and we are still uh, engaging our health promoters and malaria officers in uh, this village healthy setting uh, as we speak. So uh, there's a lot of budget on that, but I will come to that uh, on the monitoring and evalu evaluation part of that uh, village health setting uh, maybe later uh, in my next slide. The other uh, approaches uh, the malaria program undertook uh, is integ uh, integrated supervisor visits that includes uh, nurses, uh, pharmacists, and health promoters throughout the provinces. So these are done quarterly uh, or twice a year. So the malaria officers and other health officers used to visit uh, health facilities uh, to uh, assess the, <clears throat> the success and failures of what, uh, what we expect in the health facilities. This includes checking of the uh, malaria information uh, system, the data, and availability of malaria tests and uh, treatment uh, at the health facilities. Uh, at the village level, we have uh, 
I think almost all health facilities in Solomon Islands have a village health committee. And these uh, village health committees are responsible to look after the clinic. So uh, during uh, satellite visits by nurses or supervisory visits by uh, malaria officers and other health uh, officers to the communities, uh, these village health committees used to uh, meet them and uh, accommodate them in the village. And they will uh, be responsible to uh, organize the villages on what the health officers expect them uh, to do the next day and that they have to come together to meet and do uh, discussions on uh, what they are going to do. Uh, on how to uh, reduce malaria and talk about uh, other uh, issues regarding to health. Uh, the other one is uh, the inclusion of malaria disease as a subject in the school curriculum, I think, uh, and school visits by malaria officers. Yeah. So this is what uh, we also have included uh, malaria uh, subjects in the school curriculum throughout the country. And it's a, uh, we provide manuals for all schools so that uh, teachers can uh, uh, teach children on how to prevent, diagnose, and treat malaria. Uh, in terms of school visits, I think uh, this is part of our uh, operational plan where we uh, officers of the malaria have to go to uh, uh, community high schools or secondary schools or uh, tertiary uh, schools to do uh, uh, awareness on malaria and other uh, activities that are required. Next slide, please. So what do we learn about uh, our experience on these uh, community approaches? Is that uh, on the first point, I think we need more discussion on this uh, malaria uh, roadmap that was uh, developed in 2018 by the Ministry of Health and the government. Uh, as I said, I think we have done a lot, but we would like to expand to uh, the peripheries of uh, at the provincial levels for officers to be uh, uh, stationed at uh, the right uh, place where the, uh, malaria is uh, endemic. So uh, we need uh, proper logistics, adequate resources and infrastructure on that. Health awareness is one of the activities that is uh, carried out almost every year. And at least uh, I think uh, all communities around uh, 70 to 90% uh, of the population have been visited every year. But we are still, uh, we still have to get an impact on how uh, we can convince uh, or the proper way to uh, uh, encourage the communities to participate in malaria uh, uh, reduction and elimination. I think uh, because this activity is uh, have been uh, in our budget for quite a while, and uh, we include the health promotion uh, division and the malaria officers to carry out awareness in hotspot uh, villages. So during that time, they used to give them uh, feedbacks uh, on their malaria data, uh, the malaria situation of the village. Yeah. So uh, they have, uh, they are advised to look after themselves, sleep inside the mosquito nets and everything about malaria prevention have been uh, talked about during uh, those uh, awareness period. The next uh, experience we have is that we have been uh, doing this healthy village setting uh, for a few years. Uh, it was a, a project by the uh, Japanese uh, embassy, uh, JICA, and they are still uh, supporting this uh, village health uh, setting uh, model. And a few years ago, we have been doing that, but then uh, to sustain the 
uh, the ongoing success of the program of the village health setting is not uh, easy for the communities. Yeah. So after a while, when the project uh, lapsed, they don't uh, do nothing. <laughs> Well, we, Dr. Uh, yeah. Dr. Forbes, I'm, I'm very sorry. Please excuse me for, for interrupting. I just wanted to let you know that uh, we're a bit over time. Oh, so okay. if you could kindly um, help us focus on your remaining key points. I'm very sorry because clearly you have a lot more to share with all of us and we will have to find oh. um, an opportunity to follow up. But we are over time now. So if you could kindly help us wrap up, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, like uh, drug shortages and compliance is still a problem after uh, uh, being uh, advised by nurses and malaria officers. Uh, some of the villages, uh, village healthy committees are not uh, functioning as expected uh, at times. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, in terms of uh, leverage of the activities, uh, I think uh, so far the malaria, uh, the malaria program is still uh, being prioritized as one of our uh, uh, public health uh, disease in Solomon Islands. And so far we haven't got any positive COVID uh, patient in our country. So we are still uh, running normal uh, with our programs. Next slide. Although we do participate in COVID response. So the added values, as we uh, know, community participation has been stressed by other speakers, improve health and uh, health services in terms of high coverage and community uh, ownership of uh, health facilities and improve of uh, drug access and prompt diagnosis and treatment and malaria prevention in uh, communities. I think that should be my last slide. And is that it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boaz. What a wealth of, of evidence and insight. And, and among other things, we particularly appreciate you sharing not only the achievements, but also some of the challenges, um, particularly in these times. So thank you for that. Um, one, one piece of your presentation that I think is particularly relevant to the participants today and all of us in the region working towards elimination by 2030 is the importance of um, that bi-directional um, two-way communication with communities. Um, so again, reinforcing some of the earlier uh, remarks about the importance of not just thinking about community engagement as collecting input from communities or delivering uh, a product or service. Um, I will come back to you with, with a question, um, if you will, in a minute. But, but first, um, let's loop back to our first speaker and ask uh, Tin to please give us a little bit more detail. Um, one of our participants, Louis de Gama, has asked for more details about how um, different partners in the region are mentoring and coaching um, community-based volunteers. And that links to your, your, the part of your presentation where you spoke to the importance of properly trained, supervised, and supported volunteers to help eliminate malaria and address other child illnesses. Tin, can you share a minute or, or two of additional insights with respect to this question? Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, thanks for the questions, uh, Louis. Um, so in terms of um, training and su supervising the malaria volunteers, it's a critical component, especially um, generating quality services out of, uh, out of these uh, providers. It's very important. And one of the approaches that we tried in this project, which could be quite different from other NGO actors uh, working on malaria elimination would be um, the training and supervision that we use are embedded within the public health structure, which means um, uh, the our, our staff didn't really provide training themselves to the volunteer, but rather the basic health staff. It's the basic health staff, their uh, midwife and health health assistants um, are, are the one who's training them, and we as a, as 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 a facilitator provide a, a training of trainers to to those people as well. So part of that element is to ensure there is a sustainability. So when once the uh, uh, malaria consortium for instance, like stop working here, that basic health staff has enough um, resource package to 
go and train them, train them. When it comes to supervision, and I think I want to emphasize on the supervision element uh, quite importantly, and especially in my elimination. So supervision is the only opportunity that we have the supervisor and lawyer volunteers to ensure that communities enjoy the best service possible. Um, especially in the cases when a volunteer is very natural. It's, it's uh, when you stop seeing lawyer cases, you started to forget about the treatment algorithms, the treatment guidelines, for instance, or how to perform RDTs even. Uh, so this needs to be refreshed regularly. So in our project, we, we use uh, a standardized quality supervision checklist. And this is important because in Myanmar, there isn't an, any standardized methodology approach to supervising these malaria volunteers. So using this, uh, and we double up this little checklist together with input from the uh, basic health staff were actual supervisors of the volunteers because they know which issues are most pertinent to the service quality. And then it is a collective process we develop in that. And then that, that tools encourage problem solving approach because when you go and supervise people, it's usually collecting data, replenishing stock, and you go back and move on to the next village. You couldn't do really quality, quality supervision at the, at the, at the service provider, especially at the village level. So that checklist and uh, uses a problem solving approach and also an open feedback session between the supervisor and the volunteers. And one of the one of the shortfall that we found with supervision is when many of the observation we made in one visit are not routinely follow up in the next because we're going to make sure whether they're implemented or not, whether the volunteers still have issues and challenges to implement those recommendations. So we encourage that in, in making sure that the observations are well documented and so they will properly follow up to the next uh, visit. And all these data from those are reviewed regularly in the, in the quality uh, uh, supervision meeting, quarterly meetings with, to get, we bring in together the basic health staff, the volunteers again, and then we review all the issues and challenges because one issue could be a, another problem, another person could have a solution for that. So and then we facilitate that knowledge transfer processes within these uh, quality uh, quarterly meetings. So that's the, the best use of, of uh, facilitating a knowledge transfer. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jen. What a consultative uh, solution to, to coaching and, and mentoring uh, at the community level. Thank you for sharing that. I would like to turn back to Dr. Potet now. We have a question from one of our participants who's very interested in your EIP technique and would like you to, um, if possible, share a few very specific solutions that emerged out of the EIP process in Myanmar. Over oh, to you. Yeah. I'm very happy to share. So uh, last year, August and September, uh, we did an EIP uh, study in uh, northern part of the Manali region. So Manali region in, in Myanmar, in, uh, in the central uh, part of the country, in, in generally there is no many malaria, but in that one particular region, bordering to the Ashan state, there are a lot of like uh, malaria cases, and then we wanted to know why. So that we did an EIB study. I was involved in the, the entire you know, data collection and you know, all entire throughout the process. And uh, we have another that, uh, you know, there were a particular area where there is a, a illegal a lot inside uh, between uh, Manali Division and Shan State. So that is the ethnic group uh, control area. So that uh, not many people can travel to that area. So that we asked like a, a forest goer, you know, what they are uh, have seeking pattern, uh, if they are having like a SM uh, malaria. So the, the, the response they, they gave was like, uh, they before they go to the uh, forest, they bought uh, like, uh, you know, a package of like uh, a medicine with them, right? So then after that, they go to the forest. They stay in the forest like uh, you know, three weeks or one month. So if they think they have fever, they took the dress first. And then if fever cannot subside for like, uh, you know, three days or four days, and then they have to find someone to come back to the village. That is about four or five hours a motorbike drive. So there is actually no one, no, no volunteer, no even private outlets in that uh, this illegal lodging area. So that uh, we have identified this insight. And also there is no like an internet network and Wi-Fi, you know, no Wi-Fi, like a mobile network coverage in that area. So that communication is very difficult in that area as well. So then building on, you know, these learning so that we identified that, you know, there could be like a, a potential, like a, a PR worker who can be a uh, work as like a, a malaria volunteer, but also we acknowledge that reporting will be very challenging for them. It's like a, any other 
like a, a volunteer uh, programs. So that uh, we identify and train these like a uh, forest school aesthetic, uh, their PR service provider, and then that any, anyone who suffer from like a, a fever or malaria like Simian can go and uh, treat from the uh, PR, you know, uh, you know, educator, the PR uh, service provider. That is a one party rule of uh, the exam that I will give. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kotet. That, that, um, those, those additional details are very helpful in bringing the EIP process to life. And now we would like to turn back to Dr. Boaz and ask Dr. Boaz to provide some thoughts, to share some thoughts with us in terms of how he sees community engagement and community-based health workers, including the, the initiatives that he shared with us from the Solomon Islands as contributing to broader health system strengthening efforts in the Solomon Islands. What, what Dr. Boaz, can you share with us a little bit more um, of your thinking in terms of your vision for community-based health services for elimination and other primary care needs uh, contributing to the Solomon Islands efforts to strengthen national health systems? Yeah, I think you are. Uh, I think, uh... In terms of our community volunteers, I think we are trying to embark on that. But uh, now I'm just wondering on how they uh, give incentives uh, in uh, some parts of uh, uh, Asia. But uh, because it all depends on uh, the government uh, system that we are in. Yeah? Because the government would not be able to hire. Uh, volunteers they have to be employed by the government so that's it's uh, as i look at it it's uh, one of the difficult uh, uh, tasks that we are going to face because uh, during elimination we would like to uh, 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 get uh, community volunteers to assist uh, in our efforts to eliminate malaria but then uh, we'll uh, we are still working on uh, on that, and in terms of, uh, I think uh, there is a, a plan to integrate our uh, our health teams uh, during supervisor visits to the communities and the health facilities so that we can identify uh, gaps that are experienced uh, in the uh, communities. So. Uh, as we speak, I think uh, uh, the communities uh, themselves have been, uh, uh, they know about what is malaria, how it is transmitted, but then to uh, uh, fully participate is, uh, as, uh, I would say it's a challenge because they have different priorities uh, at the community level. So I think uh, we, the ministry, and the malaria program need to uh, work hard with uh, other stakeholders, uh, uh, civil societies such as uh, uh, World Vision and women's group or church groups to assist the malaria program in its effort to eliminate malaria. Thank you, Dr. Boaz. Words of wisdom and and um, and quite I think pragmatic insights about um, about the opportunities but also the challenges. I would like to thank um, our first three speakers um, and please stay with us uh, as there may be additional questions for you later in today's event. At this point, we are going to transition to the second half of our community engagement event, and we are now going to look forward. So we have, we have just reviewed some of the evidence and country specific experiences from the recent past with respect to using community engagement to support the goal of eliminating malaria in Asia Pacific. And we are now going to shift to a discussion about the more recent experience and forward looking um, learning with respect to community engagement in times of a pandemic. Um, and also with respect to significantly underserved communities, including communities at the border areas. And with no further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker in the second section. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Afsana, the deputy director from uh, Bangladesh's National Malaria Elimination Program. Dr. Afsana is an accomplished public health champion 
Um, we are very fortunate to have her with us for Malaria Week. Dr. Afsana, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jocelyn. I uh, hope everyone is doing good and good afternoon from Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a uh, delight to um, be in as a participant in this program. It's a big program and it's um, really unfortunate to meet all the uh, technical people from the malaria who are actually um, uh, the fighters to eliminate malaria from the world. So thank you so very much for um, giving me the opportunity to join with you all. Uh, so I have a presentation. So can we switch to the presentation part? So I think uh, the time is really short and um, uh, I, I, I can uh, start presenting from my side. Thank you so much. Uh, hope everyone is uh, able to see my slides. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, at a glance what actually uh, the present situation of malaria in our country. Uh, you know that uh, we have not all of the country is affected by malaria, but there are 13 endemic districts uh, they are affected. Uh, and within that 30 endemic districts, we, we have small upozilas. It's 72 upozilas are now. And the risk population is 19.5 million. And over the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2019, the cases has been reduced uh, 69%. Uh, if you can see the figure, it's 55,873 to 17,225. And the death also dis decreased um, 76%. Uh, it was 37 to 9. Um, there are all the uh, um, uh, cases that are coming from uh, the 13 districts. There are three main districts which are actually uh, in our um, importance. They are uh, uh, Rangamati, Khagrachuri, and Bandarban. These are the hill districts. We call them Chottogram hill districts. So 90, more than 90% cases are coming from there. And uh, there is uh, um, eight districts uh, in, 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 which are in the brink of elimination. And uh, you will be happy to hear that uh, from the last 10 years, uh, around 12.7 um, million free LLIN has been distributed to you know, overall the 13 districts, 13 endemic districts. And we have to thank Global Fund for this because they were really helping us on the distribution and the buying on the procurement of the LLIN. Next slide, please. Uh, so here are, uh, uh, I, I want to tell you that the, this is the community-based approach what actually Bangladesh is now experiencing. Uh, you know, the uh, Bangladesh has been uh, in the phase from control to elimination right now. So from the National Malaria Elimination Program, uh, with the help of the BRAC lead um, uh, non-government organization consortium, so we are working together as a partner. And um, free malaria services uh, at the doorstep of all the households, households uh, we, we were providing. Uh, around uh, 139 peripheral laboratory in the community is established right now. And the LLI distribution, I just let you know, just just a few minutes back. Uh, community awareness, how we do it, we make like they have a small group of people. They sit in the uh, sit in the yard, uh, just front yard. We call them Uthan. So they were they were sitting there and they're discussing and they were giving the awareness that what you should do. So we called it Uthan Boy Talk. Like lots of people gathering together and uh, they just um, uh, sharing their knowledges. And uh, we also made some uh, theater and folk songs for them, for the people. Uh, you can see in the in the pictures, you can see it that we we arranged this, these things uh, among the community. And uh, and for the sustainability, what we did um, around it's our government manifesto that the government is uh, is is providing uh, till the root level the uh, services we call them community clinic ccs so 
we had around 1,700 community clinics in, in those areas. Um, and more than 80% cases are treated in that community by those healthcare providers. Uh, less than three percent. Less than three percent uh, is severe mal malaria. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I, I just maybe lost some 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 of my comments, but hope you can see hear me. So the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, so this is what we are actually uh, going with the COVID pandemic along with malaria. So this is really tough for Bangladesh. You know um, that when the case is not identifying as you are expected, that means there are, you are actually in danger, grave danger, uh, because of malaria, it can spread from one zone to another zone by trans transmission. Uh, by, by the mosquito transmission, so uh, the, the, also the human transmission. So we are really um, in, in, in a grave danger uh, in, in this COVID situation. Uh, you see the case has been reduction till uh, July. I am showing you the slide. Till July, 54% case has been reduced, but it's not, it's, it's not bringing any happiness for the program. It's actually giving me much pressure that the case has been reduced. It's not identifying, we are not identifying. Um, and the tests also reduced. So these two are not giving us a good thing for us. Uh, if, you, if you look at the bar chart, you can see in April, it was like really low uh, than the previous years, 2019. Um, so it's really low. So uh, from that, we try to catch up, uh, we went through the, I myself in this COVID situation, I went to those hill districts and tried to um, actually uh, giving them some kind of boost, mortal uh, moral patient they had to go with uh, for the case identification uh, so that uh, they they have uh, gained some faith that the government is with them uh, they're not uh, we, we give them some um, uh, um, IPC uh, that how they can use masks and go to them and they treated patient so uh, from uh, April you can see like June July it's all uh, also increased but the thing is the number has been decreased and the number of death is increased till February, uh, till July uh, 2020. Uh, in 2019, it was three, but in, in 2020 till date, uh, we got five deaths. Uh, so we heard that we, I, I read somewhere and one of my professors said that 40% um, death will be increased in this COVID situation. And I think Bangladesh is experiencing a little bit and it's, it's really time for us to work really hard for this. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Uh, so uh, what we did uh, in this COVID situation, I just give you a little bit of glimpse uh, of that we make dengue and malaria around with COVID. We had uh, a training for the health professionals. Uh, there is awareness and protective materials uh, has been uh, distributed among the community workforce. Uh, awareness counseling also given with uh, to the community workforce. LLI and distribution in small clusters, uh, rather than the mass gathering. All, also, uh, we 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 had it. Uh, the peripheral laboratories we kept it functional in spite of this COVID situation. Uh, community counseling during the household visit of the health workers is also, we, we try to maintain this till now. Uh, what we did in, because there was lockdown um, and we had the Mal malaria day, World Malaria Day on 25th April, we started miking, like miking of awareness of malaria, that what you should do. So, because you are not going out, but for, for them, if, because they need to know. Uh, so we did the miking uh, to all the uh, areas, uh, nine, 13 districts. And we uh, distributed uh, BCC materials like leaflets, stickers to the community. Um, uh, and also they have focus uh, investigation, case investigation, 
whenever wherever we are getting cases it's all also uh, continuing we are continuing it a uh, field visit from the central level i told you that me my team we went to the field uh, in this covid situation and not you're not uh, uh, giving actually um, uh, I, I, I'm not telling that I'm brave but I'm trying to think about my people that they need to the, the health professionals they their um, moral uh, boost up needs uh, because they are my main workforce uh, who are working in the field and we have regular online meeting with our surveillance medical officers as well as the NGO program managers and whoever is working we maintain these um, ongoing meetings every month. Uh, I mean, every week we have two or three meetings. So it, it's uh, going on, going on till now. Next slide, please. So this is a glimpse of uh, pictures. If you can see that uh, they're wearing their mask, they went to the uh, households, they're keeping social distance and, main, and, uh, and giving them awareness. And also you can see in the last picture, you can see a little bit of glimpse of me. I went there and I wanted to see whether they're using the long lasting nets and the long lasting nets is actually working. So this is uh, one of our main thing and we have miking you see that people are there and they are doing miking. And also that the, the people there, the laboratory people, they are doing tests on the spot. So these we are maintaining in the community level. Next slide. Uh, so this is actually um, what are the uh, challenges we face. I told you that um, the screening of suspected malaria cases, fever, it slowed down. Uh, and the sub-center, outreach center, -center the, these are closed for the lockdown. So it is also for us uh, a little bit challenging to get the cases. Um, distribution of LLIN, it was withheld for one month. And uh, you can understand if one month is locked down, how crucial it can be for the people who are living there. Um, and the frequency of the household visits also came. Uh, case fatality, uh, fatality, facility level, cases at the facility levels, level uh, has been reduced because people are in lockdown, they couldn't come and identification of the cases goes down and also the physical, mon physical monitoring and supervision going a little bit less. And in, uh, so because of the lockdown, we cannot go uh, all the time as we are supposed to do our routine um, uh, visit. Uh, I think this is all for me. So the next slide maybe, thank you. And if you have any questions, you're open. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to give you everything. This one is actually what, uh, this slide is actually, uh, previous slide please. It actually shows that how we are going to eliminate. The colors you show, the green, yellow, and red, it's actually showing that from what timeline to what timeline we wanted to achieve uh, Bangladesh's uh, um, elimination of malaria. So I'm not going to go to details. Uh, but I think this map is uh, kind of self-explanatory and I'm not going to take more time. So thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Afsana. I, I can see in the chat that we have a number of questions for you. So please stay with us if you can. Um, it's really remarkable to see how Bangladesh has sustained malaria services at community level in COVID times, even with the refinements that you have explained. Um, and with a drop um, in, in case finding and testing in case finding as, as would be expected. So I think um, you, your presentation has remarkably summarized um, some of the challenges and also some of the innovations that, that Bangladesh is leading and that so many other countries in the region can learn from. So thank you. We will certainly come back to you in a few minutes, uh, but first we are now going to turn back to the GMS and invite Dr. Siv to join us. Dr. Siv is the malaria manager for the CNM, uh, the National Center for Parasitology, Entomology and Malaria Control in Cambodia. And Dr. Siv has a wealth of experience that he's going to share with respect to the CNM's experience sustaining um, and adapting community-based services in COVID times and in the border areas. Dr. Siv, over to you. 
Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, welcome from Cambodia. Um, actually, uh, uh, um, during the COVID-19, the everybody affect all the world and also Cambodia. Um, but we have a, a, a role to eliminate malaria in the in Cambodia, especially PM malaria need to be eliminated by this year, 2020. Besides of COVID, um, national program has been the work very strong and uh, the achievement has been still going on. As for result, we, we, I can tell you that more than 70% of cases has been reduced this year compared to last year. And especially the PF malaria reduced 80% compared to 19. And uh, we keep zero deaths since 2018 until now. And uh, uh, in contrary of the COVID-19, our, our, our death rate still increasing around 50% compared to 2019. How can we sustain these uh, these activities uh, on the ground uh, 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 properly? We have been the, uh, during the COVID nineteen pandemic in the country. We has been take some action to do reassessment of what is the COVID nineteen effect to the malaria activity in the country, and through the assessment, our program has been developed an operational plan that has been sure that we can continue our essential malaria services during the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. The regard of, of that, we have been the, 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 uh, uh, classify our, our uh, reassessment with the low risk, medium risk, and high risk in the purpose of how to uh, mitigate all these risks during uh, 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 COVID-19 pandemic in, in about to, to make our malaria activity is going on. Um, Besides on that, um, um, from the extra support from the donor and also the government, uh, NASA program has the ability to distribute some PPE to the community network and also uh, our health staff at the national level in order to make sure that they can uh, still feel safe to provide, still provide malaria services um, during the implementation. At the community level, um, we are uh, 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 make sure that the service is still going on and uh, the, the, some, some guide has been produced uh, as a flip chart in order to make sure that they still provide service to malaria. And this is very important. That's, uh, 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 that's uh, a key point that everybody had to make to know that in order to get good service from the community, you need to make community feel safe during provide services. Um, we, we also uh, 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 keep continue uh, attending the uh, monthly meeting with the, 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 the community network but rather than gather in one place, we are individual schedule of the, the, the people come into health facility individually in order to make sure that they, they still can have a malaria commodity um, supply during the, the, their implementation activity. And beside on that, we also have a, a challenge that there is a, a internal migration increasing especially the foreign activity in Cambodia, because of the, the uh, uh, most of people has been come back to the country uh, from neighboring country, from Thailand and Vietnam, because of the, the close out the border during the COVID-19. So everybody has been the, 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 uh, tried to looking for some work in the country. So internal migrant has been increasing and uh, uh, also uh, uh, forest activity has been increasing. So. Uh, through this challenge, how can we uh, uh, mitigate to this uh, activity? We have been the, uh, 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 set up um, uh, uh, hotspot services at the entry and exit point to support the uh, uh, inflow of migrant workers at risk occupation, especially the, uh, when they go to the forest. 
and also at the border, um, we we have been provide some protection to the guarantee place at the border. So this make sure that even there is a, a in the guarantee at the border, they 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 have protected from malaria. Um, we has been ensure the community uh, uh, availability in all level. We have been still uh, conduct a, a, a virtual meeting and all with stakeholder, um, with implementer, to make sure that um, every week, every two week, in order to sorry, every two week not only every two week in order to make sure that malaria commodity are available underground, but to make sure that no stock out of malaria commodity during the COVID implementation. Besides all that, we have been safe our uh, uh, bed net campaign to the how to how strategy campaign rather than do a mass campaign. And you know that the, uh, we has been hold on community mobilization activity due to the, the COVID-19, we cannot gather people in one place. But we still the, the guide the the the, the, the subnational level and community by uh, by using the social media like Facebook, and also uh, uh, using the the loudspeaker player, and that with the pre-record my education at the community, and I tell this is uh, the the some activity that's still going on in the community at Cambodia, but added added additional to that. Um, municipal health and uh, national program and also uh, multi-sectoral has been still have whole conduct uh, every uh, meeting. Um, they call the, the uh, malaria task force meeting in order to make sure that uh, uh, all the problem has been solved on time and in the real manner. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Siv. It's a, a pleasure to have you with us today and to learn a little bit more about how Cambodia has sustained community level services for malaria in COVID times um, and, and, and quite well. It's also very interesting to hear you um, explain uh, the support that has been provided to sustain service delivery along the border areas with the three countries that Cambodia shares border with. We will certainly come back to you with additional follow-up questions after our third and final speaker. Let me now introduce uh, Dr. Tet from Health Poverty Action. Uh, Dr. Tet is based in Laos. He is the Deputy Director for HPA, and he will be sharing with us today some evidence and learnings from HPA's experience implementing elimination services in Laos during COVID-19 times. Dr. Tet, over to you. Thank you very much, Jocelyn, and uh, hello to everybody in the call and beyond. Uh, it's a good afternoon and maybe good morning to some of you, depending on where you are. Maybe I would just go directly to my presentation if you can put it up. <clears throat> So I'm Seth and I am um, currently working for Health Poverty Action. Um, today, I would like to spend eight to 10 minutes uh, adding uh, my opinions to the, this auspicious event, uh, particularly around the community engagement and the challenges to sustain the community engagement in the time of COVID-19. So if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> um, I would really like to uh, focus on three key points, uh, which are uh, three, three key points regarding the challenges, or if you may like, I would like to call them as recipe, because I am kind of a person who really loves to spend a lot of time in the kitchen cooking whenever I run out of idea while doing some work. So the three key points, uh, which are pretty important uh, in making the beautiful or delicious outcome, which is the community engagement, our data, partnerships, power and politics. So by data, I mean not only the data availability, but also how we use the best out of data available to us. Of course, data availability is not um, 
an easy thing, depending on the context and the country you are in. And uh, again, even if the data is available to you, you and your partners might not uh, know or might not be able to um, analyze or, or, or convey the messages or the evidence, if you would like to call, um, to the key stakeholders. And the second bullet point is actually the partnerships. In, in, in that uh, particular element, I would really like to take this opportunity to thank everybody in this call and beyond uh, for all the efforts that you have contributed uh, towards sustaining this uh, strong partnerships, not necessarily in, in um, GMS region, but also globally from the south to the north and from the south to the south. Uh, but I, I think individually that uh, these sort of partnerships are pretty cr crucial and we have been quite lucky to have uh, this sort of partnerships already set up although they are not yet perfect i think if we go on with this pace and energy we can definitely tackle whatever challenge we have not only COVID 19 um, but also whatever challenge i won't say another pandemic and the second uh, the part uh, but not the last one is the power and politics it's pretty uh, immensely broad topic but uh, what i have observed so far is the role of the decision makers, uh, the role of uh, uh, people who are in the position to make not only the uh, political decisions, but also maybe someone who uh, can decide the direction of the programs, the direction of the sectors, or maybe even the direction of the community sectors. So that is pretty important. And uh, a lot of things really, really rely on the power and politics and how well we are committed to that is um, something uh, we can regard as a recipe or maybe a challenge in this particular case. So without further ado, I would like to present you a small example from my observation and from my work experience in Laopedia with Head Over the Action and other partners over the last six months in particular. So the slide in front of you is actually um, 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 the total of the malaria test across uh, 5,000 provinces in Laopedia from all the sectors that is uh, public uh, uh, at the facility level and private and also community level testing. So it's quite obvious in the graph that there is a steep decline in the month of April 2020, uh, the orange line uh, in compared to the data point in March. And as you may see, the, the source of the data is actually from um, HMIS of the government of Laos, uh, also known as uh, DHIS2. It is um, one of the good examples that the DHIS2 in Laopedia is not only robust, um, well, maybe it's quite an overstated, uh, but uh, pretty advanced already. And that the best thing is that it makes accessible to the relevant stakeholders and it also helps us analyze a lot of data uh, as long as uh, we can assess the system. And uh, if we look into the next slide, please. This is the fresh analysis that we did in September. So there is um, uh, actually uh, um, the, how should I say, the upward trend of the orange line again in May and, and June. And so this is um, pretty, um, um, how should I say, positive. But although this is quite a small uh, line on the graph in front of you, it is actually uh, contributed by a lot of uh, excellent contributions from every partner. If I have to mention some names, uh, the organizations uh, UN, like UNOPS, WHO, with leadership from the national program and the collaboration from the civil society organizations in the country. So if we go to the next slide. This is actually focusing on the community level testing uh, of the malaria uh, of volunteers and uh, actually in compared to the all sector total testing, it is not a significant decline in the test, um, but you can also observe a slight decline in the test. But uh, the point I would like to mention is that we did not stop at this point. We continued to make a lot of conversation and discussions and some of the uh, key questions are like, hey, what is the village level testing? What's happening there? And if we go to the next slide, um, 
we will see that it's pretty uh, granular analysis and uh, we uh, sort of like um, made the action together. And um, we of course have limitations in the time, in terms of time, workforce and everything. So we have to know where we want to prioritize, where we want to focus and where we want to learn regarding these decline in the testing of malaria. So if we go to the next slide, please. We made few field visits to those particular areas and we launched three key points. The first one is actually uh, the volunteers have, did, uh, did have experience um, stock out of malaria commodities, which is not necessarily due to uh, the poor management, but more on the lockdown measures and also uh, some parsimonious management of the commodities at the head center level, because they are not very sure how far the lockdowns would, would go on and how far the COVID-19 situations would go on at that particular time. And the second observation was the change in, slight change in behavior of health seeking uh, patterns in the community. And the last but not the least is the um, 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 level of comfort in the volunteers. They are not very, they were not very comfortable to provide malaria testing when they did not know how to prevent themselves from contracting um, 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 respiratory illnesses like COVID-19 while they provide malaria testing and treatment. And also they did not really feel comfortable because they feel like they were not well protected using the proper materials like fabric mask or surgical mask and hand sanitizers. So we did make some decisions and we also um, uh, reached out to uh, our partners and we also uh, managed, uh, if you go to the next slide, we have managed to provide <clears throat> Uh, um, surgical masks and hand sanitizers as a material support to all 2,000 malaria volunteers in 5,000 provinces of Laos, which should cover three to four months malaria testing in the community. And I think that's all about it. Uh, my presentation. Thank you very much to everyone. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so part. much. Thank you, Dr. Chat. It's it. You have you have certainly um, shared with us quite a lot in a, in a very short time. So thank you for that. And, and in particular for sharing uh, HPA's recipe for success, if you will, in terms of uh, sustaining community-based services in COVID times. It, it's, uh, we, we very much appreciate you highlighting the importance of um, motivating and protecting frontline community-based health workers in these times. And, um, and I can only imagine the logistical challenges of, um, of doing that with 2000 community health workers located throughout um, relatively remote provinces um, and areas of the country. So thank you for sharing that. We're going, to, um, we're going to now loop back to some of our earlier speakers with a few questions. We've had a very active chat. Uh, thank you all for contributing so many thoughtful questions, comments suggestions. We, we are going to save this chat history and we'll, we will use it. Um, so please keep your questions and comments coming. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to turn back um, with a question for Dr. Siv now. And Dr. Siv, um, Shri from our participants has, has asked if you could provide a little bit more information about how Cambodia is using community-based approaches to serving the needs of forest goers. And um, I think Cambodia has a lot to share with other countries in the region in terms of uh, multi-sectoral uh, approaches, collaboration between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Environment um, in terms of community-based outreach uh, with forest goers. Can you please um, share more of your experience with us? Yes, actually we have a, a strong community network in the country. But however, during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a quite challenge of, uh, uh, of the service that are provided by the community, especially to the, the forest grower. We, as I told you, we has been identified on time, the, the, the reassessment, and we, we, we know how, how to do the, the mitigation plan uh, for the community network to continue their service at the community. So in, in the reality, we, I, I can, we have been told you that the, 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 we are keep testing increasing 55% compared to 2019. This, this is a great uh, community that has been dealing with. Um, 
because we have a, a good guidance for them the how how to keep safe for them and uh, in 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 terms of the the challenge of increasing the, the some activity in the forest due to the, the, the increasing activity of the forest grower we has been the, the a strong system to identify real time where is the hot spot that some malaria is happening in the forest and by 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 using the, the this system we have ability to to create the we has uh, create a, a new hotspot services that uh, uh, around the country especially uh, where the uh, ps burden has been happened as an uh, example i can give you example that uh, one of the, 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 the province has been the increasing pf um, that we found out recently and we has been the, uh, know that it is due to the some hotspot has been increasing. So we, we identified the hotspot and we set the, the community services on time at the hotspot. And at the hotspot, we have been provided the marine services with the PPE protection that uh, uh, the community network can provide the services, cannot um, be free of uh, uh, transmission of COVID-19. And also uh, <clears throat> we provide the forest pack for the forest goer when they go to the forest in order to make sure that they can protect themselves during working in the forest. And, and, and beside on that, we have we set a screening at the, the exit and also entry point at the, at the hotspot. So we, uh, we screen everybody that pass going and out in, in, in the hotspot area in order to make sure that no, no parasite has been uh, carried out to the village. Uh, in order to protect the transmission in the in the village. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Sev. Dr. Afsana, we would like to turn back to you with a question from one of our participants. Mr. Tuan Nguyen has asked, um, how has COVID-19 containment um, measures, including the lockdown and social distancing protocols, impacted community level testing for malaria? And can you share with us more um, insight in terms of whether the restrictions are affecting um, the community health workers more or whether they are affecting uh, the individuals and communities at risk more or whether it's a mixture of both and, and what the impact is? Dr. Afsana, over to you. I couldn't hear you the last question. The first one is uh, like how uh, the COVID situation is uh, uh, affecting on the uh, community health workers. And second one was what? So in particular, how the social distancing and, um, and the lockdown measures are impacting community level testing, how they are impacting community health workers movement and organization of community level services how they are impacting the community's ability to access those services. So looking at the question from, from both, um, both angles, but in general, how are the, the lockdown and other restrictions impacting your testing at community level? Okay. okay. So, Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, we are uh, actually or well, what situation uh, with the community health everywhere. This is uh, you 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 have to admit it uh, because uh, even the, all the health workers, even the doctors, the nurses, everyone is uh, afraid of going out and because this is a novel virus and nobody knows that what are actually the symptoms and what are the uh, precautions they had to make. So in the in the field level, uh, they are the health workers. They are not always the medical doctors or nurses. They are not. They are the only the health workers who are getting the training from us and they are actually uh, treating those people. So it, 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 it was for the, from uh, in our lockdown, uh, Bangladesh started from 26 March. So from that day till one month, everything was shut down. Everything was locked down. So nothing uh, was there, no, nothing is moving there. Uh, so in that situation, the case actually 
only for the COVID situation, the case decreased. We could not send any uh, healthcare workers to go to the field. And uh, for the, that, that reason, there was no testing. Uh, there was no case identification. It happened. But after that, uh, the situation, uh, it, it, it comes a little bit like uh, normalized. Uh, we, we, from the central level, we actually communicated them uh, with the healthcare workers because uh, from the field level, uh, our com community clinics were, were there. There were civil surgeon who is the head of one district. We, we gave, provided them uh, um, personal protective equipments, uh, PPE, uh, we gave them some uh, BCC materials. We trained them on COVID, uh, the IPC, like how you wash your hand, how you maintain social distancing, uh, how you use the you know, sanitizer, how you use face mask well, where, while you are going to visit the um, uh, house to ha households. So these are trained. Like after April, from May, we tried to train all those uh, health workers um, that even with the you know, with Uthan Boitok, what we are calling that if in a meeting in the in the yard, small yard in front of your house. So they had to maintain social distancing. Uh, they, they shouldn't shake hands, but they can wear gloves and how to use it, how to use the gloves. So we actually prepared all those healthcare providers before we send them to the field again. So it was a huge work done online also. Actually, we are doing it online. The training was online. And we are also cannot move there. So this gives us a huge pressure both on us, the central level, and also with the, um, the field level people. But hopefully, and uh, by the grace of Almighty, now all the field workers, they are now able, they know how to deal with in the COVID situation, how to deal with the malaria situation. And this is how we are now detecting more cases. And uh, the testers are, tests are also um, like increases now. And we provide them the, um, the RDTs and all the necessary things we, we are having now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Afsana. Very helpful additional insight into your experience in Bangladesh. We are running short on time, um, but we would like to invite Dr. Masu from Medical Action Myanmar to share a few thoughts about Medical Action Myanmar's experience implementing community-based elimination and other integrated health services along the border areas in particular in Myanmar, given that that is um, a specific focus of today's event. Dr. Masu, welcome and please share um, a few remarks with us. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Jos, and also the admin team for organizing this and inviting me. So it's a great honor to be here. Yeah, so um, as we all know, we, um, I mean, and MEM has a 2,000 volunteers, mostly in the border area, you know, conflict affected area. So in addition to malaria, we integrated with services. We call it basic healthcare services. They are mainly the most common illnesses there that, that, you know, we train a volunteer to be able to treat the most common minor illnesses. And then also to be able to identify and refer when something went wrong and they need the, the higher, uh, high, they need the, the treatment at the facility level. So, so uh, based on the, I think during the COVID period, you know, I have to, um, I think two slides to prepare, you know, I mean, because of the misunderstanding, I was, I, I prepared at the last minute. So I think probably that's now, you know, ready to share, you know, here. So, but based on our experience that, you know, we saw that the performance, the RED testing uptake, and as well as the basic healthcare utilization, the PhD consultation, we call it consultations, has not reduced, you know, uh, during the COVID period. And, and we saw the, the, the opposite, you know, it has increased, you know, in our, at least in our villages coverage, you know, sorry, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. So as you can see that, that is from the exactly the same volunteer, the same villages from Blawa Township, you know, the 200 volunteers. So the area has not changed, the population coverage has not changed. and and then, then, you know, we can see in the two columns, the first one is about testing and the second one is basic healthcare consultation. 
So it has not reduced. And also even on the robust and you know, the, the malaria testing, like we are very committed in the very in the beginning of the year because we want to do mass screening, you know, like to target a screening to the very high endemic uh, villages that has like more than 10% early deposit rate because there is always outbreak in these villages every year in the rainy season. So we want to prevent this. So we want to do this mass screening just before the rainy season. So so when this like COVID and restriction, but we are determined to do this, make it happen despite the COVID and then we achieve. So as you can see here, the service utilization has not reduced. And I think the lesson learned from, from, from next slide, please. From here, you know, I mean, we, and um, based on our experience, it's like we, the first one is about proactive planning. You know, we, I mean, we know that this is coming because in other country, you know, we know that COVID is happening in other countries. So what are we going to do in this country? What are we going to do in this scenario when there is no local transmission, where there is no local transmission, when there is death? So based on the different scenarios, we develop action plan. So proactive planning. Proactive planning includes like, you know, even before, like, like in, even in January, we are procuring a lot of, you know, drugs to be able to supply. So if we, we cannot go there, then we have to make sure that we ask the volunteer to continue the services to do product themselves and also to provide the services, you know, because they will be the only provider in the community at the time if everything is blocked. So, so we procure a lot of drugs and we send to make sure that like previously three months of our stock at the community level, now we send six months, eight months stocks, you know, depending on that. So that kind of contingency plan works. And also, uh, let's move to the number third point, which is flexible operational strategy. So we are very flexible, you know, we work in a very, like the, the, the situation is changing dynamic. You cannot like stick to, you know, one scenario. And therefore, like whenever the feeding thing that they need support, they want to change the strategy, they can communicate channel is open and they can really contact and we switch, you know, we want to buy the drug. We need to buy the, the PPE and marks, you know, I think uh, we also should thank to the, the, the very flexible donor, like private donor, because on top of the institutional donor, like Global Fund, we also have the, some other private donors. For this report, we just need a Skype call. We explain the situation. They are very understanding and they, so flex, having a flexible operational strategy and opening the communication channel, these are the, also the key. And also using lesson learned from other emergency contexts, you know, and adjusting the strategy. What I mean by that is we have been working in a conflict affected area. So, and also we have worked in the in a disaster situation. So we have learned a lot, you know, these, these contexts. So for example, we, I mean, in a, when you work in a conflict, in a war zone, you don't know when you will be able to visit this village or this volunteer next time. You can visit this month, this week, but next week, this is blocked. So we are always have a contingency plan. We have the different strategy method. Okay, we will come to you, and then next week, or like next month, this week, if we don't come under third week, you come to this year. Or we were sent with the public transport or anything, something like that. So that a lot of lesson learned that we use, yeah? Thank you so much, Masu. This is yeah. really, really wonderful insight. And, and I'm so glad that we were able to share your slides. We will make them available through the chat. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So if you will forgive me. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Okay. Masu. And we will we will come back to our to our overall group of participants and, and three speakers. Um, we are running very short of time, and I can see that we are losing a few of our participants. So I would like to acknowledge um, the the wonderful um, data and case studies that have been shared in both of our sessions um, by our speakers. Um, the very thoughtful questions from all of you participants. Um, and I am sure there are more among our observers who have been with us today as well. It has been a very rich um, learning experience today. Clearly, as, as we always conclude um, with every Atman Apama meeting, we need more time <laughs> to digest um, and to, to share these good ideas and emerging best practices. And, um, and certainly uh, today's event will, will, will spring us forward and we will, come back to all of you with, with more thoughts about how we can keep this amazing work that you are all doing um, at the community level going. And, and most importantly, how we can 
um, continue to share best practices and learnings across the region, which is one of many strengths of the, of the Atman network. Um, I would just like to, before we leave, ask everyone one last question, which uh, we're going to ask you to please respond to in the chat. Um, please help us by, by sending us your thoughts in the chat about one key message that you would like uh, Atmen and Applema to deliver to senior officials this week with respect to community engagement. Um, clearly, multiple speakers have demonstrated the value of community engagement, not only in contributing to elimination, but also um, other integrated primary uh, health services and COVID-19 um, containment efforts. So, Please help us draw attention to the data and the case studies that you have presented and the thoughtful questions and learnings that have evolved through today's event. We're looking for one key message for senior officials. Please share your ideas with us in the chat. And with that, I thank you all and I turn it back over to Joe to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And I think everybody agrees you did a wonderful job and energized us throughout the last two hours. And uh, I also want to thank, of course, everybody else uh, for staying. Some of you have been online for four hours and um, I just have to admit that we have one more poll to fill out. It takes only one minute. So before you switch off, um, please uh, fill out the poll that will appear in a second because we want to know a little bit how this meeting was for you. We're asking in one go, um, so for both meetings. So please give us another minute of your time. And otherwise we are looking forward to seeing many of you in the next days. This was just the beginning, day one of Malaria Week. And so hopefully you can join some of our sessions during the rest of the week. Tomorrow we have an interesting session on surveillance and timely reporting. We have on financing, on innovation, and then the SOM on Friday, as Jocelyn highlighted. So hopefully many of you join our other sessions. And if you have time, do what Jocelyn asked for. Let us know what are the key messages we should actually bring into the SOM. We try to distill some joint messages from all the qualitative comments and from the discussions we heard today. So thank you very much to all of you. Have a good day or have a good lunch, depends on where you're calling in from. And some of you may be have, having even a good night and see you hopefully tomorrow. Thank you all. <laughs>